So I built my dream desk and it deserves a video. This video is about how I incorporated the dog holes into the design of this desk, as well as a steel strip running along the back. So my desk requirements list looked something like this. It needs to hold the things that kept getting in my way before, the lights and the microphones, cameras. Number two, plenty of space to write on paper. I take my brain dumps on paper and I prefer to have some space when doing so. Number three, adjustable lighting. So it can shine on the desk, the whiteboard, or me. Number four, it needs to support context switching so I can separate my real job from my hobby and not be surrounded by both all the time. And number five, good cable management because we all want that. I found some cherry lumber in the garage, so I used that for the tabletop, then I ordered a motorized base from Amazon, one with two motors so it can support the weight of the tabletop. I'll put a link in the description. It's a pretty magical experience. Oh, and the numbers on the display are surprisingly accurate. 47.3 inches tall, that's what that thinks. 46 and 5 eighths plus 0 0.73. 47.355, 47.3, that's cool. So after I finished playing leapfrog with the lumber, I went ahead and surfaced it, cut it, ripped it, and glued it to make a panel that's about six feet long by two and a half feet deep, the same size as the folding table I had been using prior to this. It's gonna be a really big bummer when these look like that here in just a few minutes. Ah, let's just remember what's to come. I mean, this is from soaking up the sunlight in the garage over there. Speaking of that, look at this. This is cherry. This was on the edge on the end of this where I had a little more sun. Look at that. Oh. So it's a little lighter back there, but that's still heartwood. This with a bit of sun. What's that? That's why I like cherry. All right, you wanna see sun-tanned cherry become bland pink, never seen daylight before cherry. By the way, this is not ever actually seen the sun, seen the they let out of the garage. I don't have the garage door open very often at all. I have a video on this technique about halfway done, just not really sure how to prioritize finishing it with the rest of the videos on my short list of videos I definitely, definitely wanna do. If you have any opinions on the matter, let me know. Now when chopping the ends off of a glue up, they say to take that sliver and try and break it to test the glue joint. I mean, it's kind of cheating because of the grain direction, but it looks encouraging. Did it go in? And I missed from there. I'd like to find a two inch wide flat bar to run along the back of the desk for mounting things with magnets. Quick tip, if you just bought your first welder then you get freaked out by how expensive metal is, you may be buying metal at the wrong place. Here's what I mean. At Home Depot, which I like, you can get a six foot stick of one and a half inch hot rolled steel angle iron, an eighth of an inch thick for $19.91. That's $3.32 a foot. And I didn't even pay $3.32 for my own foot. But the metal yard has the same thing for 56 cents a foot. That's a sixth of the price. Now, the downside is you gotta buy the entire 20 foot stick. This metal yard lets me pull my trailer up, park in the middle of the yard, pull out my battery powered Makita bandsaw and chop it up. Oh, it's too bad, that was a lot of dust. <laughs> I'm routing the rabbits for the metal to reset. I'll make sure the metal oh, sorry, you first. still protrudes above the rabbit. 
It's kind of pinching my nose. A little bit. It's time to poke some dog holes in this desktop. So since I'm using the MF slab as a template for routing the dog holes, I'm gonna go ahead and plan out the layout. Now my main consideration at this point is to make sure the dog holes don't land on the desk frame. I can always adjust the desk frame if necessary, but I'd rather the desk frame be as wide as possible and just do proper dog hole planning now. Now since the MF slabs dog holes are on a 96 millimeter grid and therefore a 12 dot Lego grid, I'm gonna use this fast cap metric measuring tape, which has triangles at every 32 millimeter increment. So every three triangles would be 96 millimeters. And I center punched where the holes would be so the drill bit doesn't wander. And I pre-drilled using a half inch drill bit. That way there's less material for the router to route because a drill bit will do the job with a lot less dust. Then I'll finish it off with a router. So I definitely wanna make a note about safety here. If uh, you're not used to working in spaces like this, if kickback would cause a blade to start dancing around, just be sure you're taking off little tiny bits at a time. Let's just say I had a bad situation on the spindle sander a few years ago. Since the MF slab wasn't wide enough for my desktop, I had to do a little shift -aroo, and the yuppie puppies came in really handy for that, the tall ones. And by the way, if you don't have an MF slab or Festool MFT to use as a template, just buy a 20 millimeter drill bit, center punch your hole locations, and just drill the holes. At least for a desktop, I don't think a precise layout is really all that important, unless you're designing attachments that'll span multiple holes. And instead of doing a large round over, which I just think is really ugly, I'm gonna give this a natural look by sort of pushing the edge back into the sapwood. Low speed. And the sapwood's coming in here, so I'm gonna take away some of that. So I'm making sure that this is not a sharp edge. Over there it's fine, and over there it's fine. Which is why I chose this board. The sapwood sort of set this piece up for doing that. I'm using the circular saw backwards to give a little bit more aggressive cut than I was getting with the sandpaper. The blade is not backwards. I'm just going backwards to avoid gouging. And the same technique can be used on a lot of saws, like the band saw, by the way. Then back to the slow speed angle grinder sander to remove the teeth marks left by the circular saw. Then to the squishy backing pad on the random orbit sander to polish things up. I'm definitely not going for uniform here. Final sanding. Then to sand the sharp edges of the holes, I used a custom sanding technique. A couple years ago, I released a video that's all about custom hole sanding attachments. So check that out the next time you get uh, really, really bored or have a lot of holes to sand. Now, isn't it weird with woodworking that when you get to the finish, you're not actually finished? Now for the bottom, I sprayed polyurethane. Now the main thing here is that I don't get drips of finish in the holes. And in this case, I felt more confident using spray poly. Once the bottom is dry, my focus returns to the top. Orbital sander, resand at 180. Hand sand with the grain at 180. Dampen a paper towel and wipe down the surface. This will not only remove the sanding dust, it'll also show you any major sanding scratches that you need to deal with before you apply the finish. Then for the top, I just used a 50-50 mix of polyurethane and mineral spirits, or paint thinner, same thing, to create a wipe-on poly. Now for the top, I don't mind if I accidentally get some finish in the holes, even if it's a drip of finish. That's fine, because I'm intending to finish the holes, not with a drip, but I am poking the hole, kind of giving it a wet willy of sorts, and while that risks causing a drip beneath the surface, it's not a big deal, because now beneath the surface is the bottom of the desk. Now, I mentioned I used a 50-50 mix of mineral spirits and polyurethane. For the first few layers, I used gloss polyurethane. For the last two or three, I used satin. And that helps keep the finish clear while still having that matte, sort of dulled appearance. Now that the top's finished, it's time to install the steel strip which will go in the rabbit you see on the right, to the left of the dog holes. As you can see, desperation has led me to adopt a double-decker tool cart sort of setup, which has actually been pretty convenient. These countersink bits are magical. I'm not sure who was on what in order to come up with these, but they work so well.
It's done, time to mount. Now since this is a solid wood top, it's gonna expand and contract with the seasons. Holes don't account for that. Typically we'd use slots, this doesn't have slots, just holes. But it does have tabs. So to achieve the same effect, I'm going to screw to the sides of the tabs. But to anchor the tabletop in place, I will use holes just only in one line. And that'll anchor this part of the table in place and the expansion and contraction will happen to the sides of that. Quick tip, when drilling up through something important where you might drill through it, use a stop. And be sure to mount the stop against the chuck so if it comes loose, then nothing bad happens. From experience. Same thing over here. There we go. All right, look, I can't wait to show you the cool whiz bang stuff about this desk, but first we gotta cover the basics, the forever stuff, the stuff that's always here. We need to start by taming that and getting that out of the way as much as possible. Now I wanna draw a clear line, this one, between forever stuff and temporary stuff. I wanna get the forever stuff out of the way and optimized before I bring in anything temporary. So I started with the power supplies that'll always be here, wrapped them up, bundled them up, got rid of loose cords, zip tied, tucked away those cords will never become part of a tangled mess. USB supplies are mounted out of sight, yet reachable from the top of the desk, and they're mounted securely so they're always in the same spot so I don't have to dig to find one, ever. Using an external monitor keyboard mouse let me put my real job computer on the floor, out of the way. For the monitor stand, the hydraulic arm feature is nice because you can do all this crazy stuff, and even the keyboard and mouse play a part with optimizing this basic setup. The keyboard is a Keychron K2 mechanical keyboard, and it's 75% layout, which is perfect for me, and the colors look great with the cherry. The mouse has a really good sensor, so I don't need a mouse pad. It's one less thing on the desktop and one less thing to move around when I move around the mouse. Sure, it might wear down the finish a bit over time, but that's called patina. 